But Ebba Youngest wants to get this. I said, why? He's choosing my old age home. <laughs> He's choosing my retirement home. <laughs> That's his lines. So but anyway, it's just so interesting to watch yourself age. I'm a person who remember things. I don't remember anything. I literally have a class full of boys. I teach them five times every two weeks. It took me about two months to learn their last names. I work on the first names. But after Hanukkah, I'm going to have to relearn it all. Because I missed a week or two. I'm going to literally have to relearn their names. It's amazing. But okay, what are you going to do? My wife says, you can't talk that way. So listen, I might as well laugh rather than cry. Don't you think? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's amazing to watch your body. They say that the you know, when the Rebbe had his stroke, Leleno, they uh, they got a machine to come to 770 to do an MRI. So the first time they came was the night of the stroke. The stroke was on a Monday night, and it took a very long time to get such a machine. They never had a problem after that, never. Anytime they called, they got a machine right away. Why? The machine's cost $10. It's a truck that's got a, a mobile MRI. So I was like, who you are? Come now. You have to make an appointment and schedule. Sometimes they paid a lot of money, they got the machine to come. They examined the Rebbe's brain. I have a tape of Yingi Bishkiski, I remember I told him, describing it, that as soon as the Rebbe's brain came up on the screen, the technician says, oh my God. So Yingi says to him, what, it's terrible? He says, no, I've never seen a brain like that. I've never seen a brain like that. He tells him that as we age, our brain shrinks. And the brain cavity is filled with fluid. The Rebbe had a young brain. Physically, biologically, the Rebbe's brain had not aged. And I, uh, may please take these. And I understand, you don't say, but they found the same thing with Albert Einstein. When Albert Einstein died, and he donated his brain to science, he had a young brain. The brain did not shrink. And somebody told me, um, a relative of mine who knows that the Nabiel was ill, the Nabiel Khan, the Rebbe's, really, the Rebbe's mouthpiece. The title that we have, all of this is due to this one man, Nabiel Khan. He lived till 90 something years old. He was elderly, they did an MRI in his brain, and it hadn't aged. But I can tell you, my brain's aging. <laughs> Had a steady face. Um, I think the way to prevent your brain from aging is to use it. If you use it fully, it just doesn't have a chance to get old. Um, and Abiel, Abiel was 85, 90 years old, and his recall was as good as it was when he was 20, which is extraordinary. It's very unusual. Uh, one of the Rebbe's uh, transcribers, Rebbe David Feldman, I didn't hear it today, but I heard from his name. A lot of the Rebbe's talked, and the Rebbe spoke for 40 years, and the Rebbe spoke for thousands of hours. And it's all tied, all original. And there was a certain Fabrengian, which we didn't have, missing. From 1957, and this happened after Gibel Thomas, after 1994. So how many years have passed? A minimum of, I don't know, 30 years. And David Feldman finds a Hanach, he finds a transcript of that Fabreng that we didn't know existed. So he goes over to the Biel, Biel Khan, and he shows him the original transcript. Look, there's missing a bunch of stuff. So Biel says, yeah, I remember. Right. And he proceeds to recite from memory a Fabrengen that the Rebbe said 30 years before, 30 years before. And David knows it's accurate because he's holding Hanukkah. David is listening to him talk and he knows that he's not making it up because he's holding in his hand the transcript. So as Abiel is reciting it, the David starts to speak with him. And Yael says, how do you know it? He says, because I'm holding the transcript in my hand. And he knew by heart a, a talk for hours that the Rebbe said 30 years earlier. It's not like the Rebbe said one talk. The Rebbe said thousands of talks. And Yel Khan was there for each one. He was the Rebbe. Without the Yel Khan, the volume of the Rebbe's tater would be reduced probably by a fraction of 10. I, I don't think it's an exaggeration. Especially the more difficult ideas, the, the scholarly ideas, the creative ideas. People could remember words. He understood. The Rebbe would come up with a new approach to learning. Before the Rebbe was done talking, he had it all figured out. He had an incredible brain, unbelievable brain. And his brain never aged. Well, my, my brain is aging. So one of the symptoms is my inability to remember names. And now I, I don't even remember faces. Wow, that's a new level. It's a Naya Madregan. <laughs> so uh, I have chosen the path of laughing at myself. The previous Rebbe used to 
say, he said it more than once, that if you don't want to forget anything, never say you forget. Never say, but I keep forgetting that instruction. <laughs> That's my weakness. But you see, some people are actors, you know. I'm a teacher in a school. I'm a teacher once a week. And there's also your girls, and I have a different relationship with girls than I have with boys. With these hours every day, for hours every week, and my own students, I, remember, I don't remember their names, and the uh, boys in the other classrooms, every single week, what's your name? What's your name? It's a joke. Because three times a week, I lecture to the whole school. Every morning, I lecture to my class, and three times a week, I lecture to the whole school. So whenever that happens, it's like the biggest joke if I remember their name, and some of the kids get insulted. So I know people who play, you know? They just make believe they know who you are. Oh, yeah, it's nice to see you. And, yeah, really? <laughs> but I, uh, I'm, that's not one of my uh, strengths. So our boys say, here we go, Kindalach. Thank you for all for coming on Chayanakeh. I realize that Chayanakeh is vacation time. And judging from the attendance, I'm going to go with the assumption that people are busy enjoying Chayanakeh with their families. This, I think, is our third week. I missed last week. I missed last week. I was in, I wasn't at a wedding, California, Baruch Hashem. So I was at the wedding, yeah, Baruch Hashem. It's a good excuse, yeah, good excuse. Um, it's a third class on Nadini Makabal, and on the Shem Yichud, which is those two lines before Baruch Shaman. And um, I feel very stupid, because every week I look more, and I realize all the things I said wrong the week before, I need to fix them, you know? So it's like, when I'm done teaching you, I'll be ready to teach you. That's how this all works. Um, so last week's big discovery was that and I actually found it this morning. I, I found it again. I didn't find it in the Kunizaya. I didn't find it in the Gnomus Kunizaya, but I did find it in the Kisa Malk's Pirish on the Gnomus Kunizaya. But I did find it in Kisya Riza, it was called Shara's Midas, which is the weekly we say it every morning to the Zimbabwe, it's called Shara's Midas. That the Ariza writes, he's supposed to say before every mitzvah. The shame that he's all right before every mitzvah, the shame. So, when I came here two weeks ago, two classes ago, I told you what the test in Adain Evan Yisrael's book, may he rest in peace, that the source of the shame yichud is from, um, they say, the Kise Melech, the Zagalov, Shalom Bezagalu, who was a little bit before the Alter Neb. Then I came back last week. Well, it says also in Shalom, and it's also brought the name of the Arizal. I, f- I found it this morning in the Arizal, and again, the original source of it is the Zayah. It's the Zoya. The Zoya doesn't say to say the prayer. The Zoya says to do the meditation. And um, later on, people made a prayer out of it. Now, if you were here two weeks ago, the class two weeks ago, he did two things. But the dominant feature of the class of two weeks ago was a quote from a book written by our Rebbe's grandfather's grandfather called Shara Kailo. It's the first comprehensive commentary on the Alter Rebbe Siddur. Shara Kailo, a wonderful piece of work by a great scholar, a really, really masterful scholar, Tamad Chochem and Gon, and I guess you could call him a Kobol also. And he wonders about the Shem Yichud, and he does, he does a really unusual twist on it. Because the Shara Kailo's question is, if we're doing the Shem Yichud prayer, as all Kabbalists do, we should do it as all Kabbalists do, which is before each mitzvah, before you put tzitzah, I told you this, when I was in the Satna Bungalow County, every morning, before you put in your talus, they would wander around the room, read like a half a page of words, beautiful, beautiful stuff, which we don't do, the shame you could put on tzitzahs. Then they would do another wandering around the room, the chassidish, the nan chabadnikis, they walk around when they die, for better or for worse, that's what they do, they wander. And, it gives, and it's beautiful words, and then he said the shame you could, he puts on this tefillin. We do the shame you only once a day, and we don't do it before we're doing a mitzvah, we do it before we say Baruch Shammah, which is a prefix to a prefix to Shemayna Essay, which is the mitzvah of Tefillah. So the Shara Koyal wonders, why did the Alter Rebbe do this? Why did the Alter Rebbe decide that we should say L'Shem Yechud once a day? If we're saying it, say it before each mitzvah. If we're not saying it, don't say it at all. What's this business of doing it before one mitzvah? And he actually gives a nigla answer. The Shada Koyal, this is, if you were here two weeks ago when we learned this, the Shada Koyal, the Shem Yichud is straight out of the Zoya. You, it's a Kabbalistic term. Yichud, Tremich, Shente, Yud, Kevach, it's all Kabbalah words. But he actually explains that all these Kabbalah words are being said for a halachic purpose. And the halachic purpose is that davening is like a carbon. And a carbon needs to be the Shema, carbon for the sake of heaven. Meaning, the Shada Koyal is wondering about the Altar Rebbe. 
Do we say L'Shem Yechad before a mitzvah, or do we not say L'Shem Yechad before a mitzvah? If we do it before a mitzvah, we should do it. If we don't do it, we shouldn't do it at all. So his resolution is that we're saying L'Shem Yechad once a day because we're doing it for davening. In other words, he's saying we don't do it for mitzvahs, we do it specifically for davening. And the reason we're doing it specifically for davening is because davening is like a carbon, and a carbon needs kavonis, one of those kavonis for the sake of heaven. So he actually niggleizes the Kabbalah. The reading Kabbalah words before we start to daven, but those Kabbalah words are said before we daven, not for Kabbalistic reasons, but because of the halachic need to daven for the sake of a Kaddish Baruch. This is the position of the Shada Koilo. And two weeks ago, when I was here last, we spent the first class, which was longer than the second class, reviewing this. Okay. Then we learned the Lakuta Teda, and I actually gave you the page. I don't know if you remember, I gave you the page of the Lakuta Teda. We reread what the Alter Rebbe has to say about L'Shem Yichud, explaining it mystically, Apikabo. Now, you're going to see in today's class, which is this Sikha, but I suspect that this is going to be in our second, I'm going to stop, and when we start, we're going to read the Sikha. The Rebbe, in quote, disagrees with his grandfather. I told this to you that I had a teacher, who used to say that, I never heard the Rebbe say this, but he's older than I am, that the Rebbe used to say, here I, here I disagree with my grandfather. Shara Koyal was the Rebbe's Mother's great grandfather. He was his grandfather's grandfather. He was an incredible god, unbelievable Talmud Chacham. And um, the Rebbe did not know him. He passed away probably 15 years before the Rebbe was born. But I'm assuming the Rebbe's mother knew him as a girl. And um, the Rebbe is going to disagree with the Shadak Koilo. And basically, the nature of this agreement is going to be is that the Shadak Koilo resolves the question of why we say Lishem Yichud only once a day and not before every mitzvah. By explaining it, api halacha, api nigla. And the Rebbe can say, oh no, my grandfather's wrong. The Alter Rebbe holds that we say the Shemir for Kabbalistic reasons. And we do say it in relationship with every mitzvah. But for reasons we're going to get to later, we only do it once a day. So the Rebbe is going to disagree with his grandfather. His grandfather held that we say, that according to the Alter Rebbe, that we say it only once a day. The Shemir is for halachic reasons, before davening, like a carbon, it's not about mitzvahs. And the Rebbe is going my grandfather's wrong. It is about mitzvahs. It is about Kabbalah. We do it once a day because we're really not Kabbalists. That's what it's going to come down to, as you're going to see later on today, okay? But last week, when we did all of this stuff, I also gave you some insights from other holy books on the meaning of the Shem Yichud, from Hasidic, the sources. Um, so what I want to do is this. Today's class will be dominated by the Sikh. This is, I think it's a watershed sikha. I think it's a classic sikha, the Rebbe. Where it, it, was, it was given out the last tissue before the stroke. It came out, Rosh Hashanah, Tov Shin, and Bez, 1991. And in this sikha, there are other sikhas like it, but this sikha I think is very direct. The Rebbe presents his understanding of what the Yalta Rebbe meant when he made his siddur. What was the Yalta Rebbe's intent? And making what we call the Alter Rebbe's Nusach. And when we, when we learn the Sikha, which I hope to do today, I'll explain to you more what the controversy is, what the question is, okay? But before we get to the Sikha, I just want to share that this morning I looked more and I found more insights from Hasidic Rebbe's about, non Chabad Hasidic Rebbe's, about the significance and the meaning of the Lishem Yichud. So I want to start today's class in addition to the review that I just did, by sharing you some insights from other Hasidic Rebbe's. I touched on it a little bit last week. Um, I guess I could say I'm more prepared to talk about it now. Um, from various Hasidic Rebbe's. The first source that I want to cite is the told of Yankov Yosef. The Yankov Yosef, he was, a, he was a student of the Baal Shem Tev. Many thought he had the rightful, he should have been the, the Baal Shem Tev successor. He wasn't. The Magid was, he was a very great man. He knew the Baal for a very, very long time. And he asked the L'Shem Yichud a thought. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you. The thought that he has, I'm keeping in my pocket because I want to leave it for last. It was the last thing I'm going to be talking about is where the Tanya talks about L'Shem Yichud, but I don't want to give it away right now. But the Vart of the Taldus is very similar to that of the Alter Rebbe. I'm just going to say it. Very briefly now, we will revisit it later in Mitzvah Hashem. Later means not this week, but hopefully next week. And that is that there is a question in theology, which Rabbi Manus Friedman is very busy with these, dear, these years. We do Judaism, we're doing it for us, and we're doing it for God. 
And the way to say it in fancy Hebrew is it's it's three words. Avoida Tsoidah Gavoya. Avoida means work, Tsoidah for the benefit, Gavoya of heaven. And it can either be written with a question mark or with a period. Avoid the Tzodah Gavoy with a question mark means God really cares what we do. And the answer to the question is no, it's not for God, it's for us. And there's a whole body of Jewish theologians, the non-mystical, the philosophers who say, avoid the Tzodah Gavoy with a question mark. Hashem doesn't care, it's for us. But the Kabbalists disagree and they say, no, avoid the Tzodah Gavoy you are for heaven. They matter to him. So the Talmud of Yom Yosef says that the reason we say L'shem Yichud is because we want to declare as we serve God, learn how to do mitzvahs and daven. In other words, he holds it up for every mitzvah is we're not doing it for ourselves only, in parenthesis. And we're doing it for God as well. So that's the first insight. Now this first insight that the Talmud brings I think is consistent with the Tanya, which I'm going to leave for a separate class because I want to get all excited about that, Okay. Then um, he brings, I, this is all from a book which is called Sidna Ganyam Kabbalah from Yor Weinstock, which I have, and I, I forgot to look up. I, I'm a fool because it would have been one of the best sources. Had I looked him up in the beginning? Who's the book by? His name is Weinstock, Yor Weinstock. He lived in Jerusalem. He lived 84 years, wrote 84 Svarim and Kabbalah. He lived in our times. He passed away in 1980. I guess that's not near times, but I was 15. Uh, 14. He was a great man. He was a great Kabbalist in Jerusalem, and the Rebbe had a relationship with him. Um, and he wrote a whole set of Svatim called Siddur HaGoinim HaMakabalim HaChasidim. He explains the Siddur according to the Goinim, that means Nigla and Halacha, and the Makubalim, that's Kabbalah, and also Hasidus. So he brings from the Kamarnim, one of the great Hasidic Rebbes, was uh, Isaac of Kamarnim, the music Isaac of Kamarnim. And he his uncle was the Teres Tzvi. I don't have time to give you the history, it's not important. The Pesha did the Choyver. See, he, the Pesha did the Choyver didn't have any sons. So when he passed away, his nephews all became a Rebbe in his place because they were his sister's sons. And one of the most famous of those sons was the Rebbe Isaac of Kamane. And the Rebbe used to mention the Kamane by Fabrengens. The Rebbe held very highly. In fact, he's in the back of the Lava He's mentioned about saying Tillin, saying uh, Mishnayis at the end of davening is from the commandment. Our source was from this commandment. He was a very big God and a very big Mukubal, and the Arabim held of him. And the Kabbalah drank a glass of water. He didn't do anything without saying it's for God. He was a very holy man. He was a very, very great Kabbalist. He lived, he sat in Kabbalah. He was a contemporary of the Rebbe's, and he seems to be quite similar. He was completely immersed in mysticism. And he used to say, you know, the would put, you don't just serve God with your mitzvahs. You serve God with a cup of water. And he would literally say, before a glass of water. He, every move in his life, he would say, it's not for me, it's for God. In other words, it's not even for me to get close to God. It's for God. God needs me to do it. This command in Rebbe, I, 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 I knew a, this I tell us Tzvi, the the, the, the Trevi Rebbe. I I for many many years davened by the base of Yeshen Shul across from the police station, and the rabbi there who is now deceased was a descendant of the the, the Trevi Rebbe. He's very proud of that. So he told me that the 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 the, 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 the Trevi Rebbe, Tzvi, who was who, I don't think he's his grandfather. He's his great great uncle, great 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 uncle, said on his deathbed. He was lying. He was passing away. He was holding his hand in his hand. And he talked to the book. And he said, Zoya, Zoya, who will ever learn you the way I did? That's what he said. And it wasn't arrogance, it was truth. Who will ever learn you the way I did? Because in Hasidus, we're taught that you learn Taita and do mitzvahs for two reasons. The first reason, it brings you closer to God. The second reason is for the sake of the Taita. The Taita needs us to learn it to bring the Taita closer to God. And that's the meaning of this. Everything I do is not for me. Everything I do is just for Akadosh Baruch. Is that again? The quote that he used? No, not the Zohar. We do it for in order to bring closer to Hashem. To bring the Torah closer to Hashem, not ourselves. That is the deeper meaning of the Shema, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get to this at length next class, next week. Um, but that's what they were saying. That's why he would say the Shem Yichud, not just saying he did a mitzvah. He would say, "You have a glass of water." He didn't. He did not allow himself to 
do anything in this world without acknowledging that not only he's doing it as a servant of God, which is which is a high level in itself, but he's doing it for God's sake, which is a much higher level. Yeah, it's fascinating. Number three, and this is from the Kalina, the Besaren, the Baden the Kalina. The Besaren was written by his whatever. The, I don't know. I'm not an expert in these fields, but it was the Zay, the Ainu Gavur the Sefer called Besaren, and um, he writes uh, an idea which is very familiar to us that Taita is very complex, and the Jewish people are very complex, and. The wholeness of Torah, the health of Torah, is only when each point of the Torah is connected to the entirety of the Torah. And when each point of the Jewish people is connected to the entirety of the Jewish people. And the example of it would be that if Chas a person is missing a finger, let's say. That deficiency doesn't only affect that organ, it affects the entire body. Because the balance and the health of a person is the equilibrium, is that everything is used completely and com whole and health of us, which is not whole and health work, are compromised and they have to overcompensate, which is the chuva idea. It's not the tzaddik idea, it's the chuva idea, because you have to overcompensate for what you're missing. But in a healthy body, you use every organ, every part of your body in a comprehensive way. So he argues that the Jewish people are that way. But every morning, we, Chabad Nikis, from that ease, I'll say, you accept upon yourself the mitzvah of Yisrael. And the reason, according to Kabbalah, is because if you hate a single Jew, you hate the piece of yourself, because all Jews are connected. If you hate a piece of yourself, when you pray, the piece of yourself that's representative of that person is not included in your prayer, so your prayer is not whole. So for an act of Jewishness to be whole, you need, number one, that each individual mitzvah should be connected to all the remaining mitzvahs. And number two, that each individual Jew should be connected to all the other Jewish people. That creates a wholesomeness in my single act. I'm doing one act. I'm one person doing one act. One act means I'm doing one mitzvah out of 613. I'm one person out of millions. But the wholesomeness of that act is how that one mitzvah is connected to all the remaining mitzvahs, and how this one Jew is connected to all the remaining Jews. And that's the reason for the Shem Yichud. You're saying the Shem Yichud to join your mitzvah with the remaining mitzvahs and your person with all the remaining Yiddish people to create health, wholeness, balance, if I may use a bad word, a tzaddik like Judaism. The opposite of tzaddik like Judaism, the Balchuba like Judaism, which is where we're, we're all busy. Balchubas are not perfect. We're not perfect in the love of fellow, we're not perfect in the fulfillment of mitzvahs. So we we do chuva, which is we, the ones we do, we do better than the tzaddik does because we can't do them all, we can't do the rubber balance. But he explains it in the tzaddik model, which is very consistent with a lot of the Hasidic rebbes, which I'm going to speak about in a moment, that by saying l'shem yechud and including yourself with all the other Jewish people, you want your mitzvah, A, to be connected to all the rest of the Torah and B, all the rest of the Jewish people so that it'll be a whole and balanced mitzvah, a tzaddik-like mitzvah, which is why we say according to the base Adam. And then you have the Rab Shetzer, Zerak Kodesh and Rab Shetzer, and Igor the Kala, who I don't know who it's from, who say the same thing I just said, they just say it in different words. They say, and this is such a Hasidic idea, this is really more, I mean, we're living in a in a dark time, but if you can go back to before the Holocaust, what I'm about to say is classic Hasidus. Not Chabad, not Chabad. Forget, Chabad is not this way. Typical Hasidus, typical non-Chabad Hasidus, one of the, I mean, the key ideas that it's all about the Tzaddik, it's all about the Tzaddik. You know, you learn this in Breslov. If anybody's been around Breslov, you hear that even now. It's all, everything is the tzaddik. Everything is the tzaddik. Yeah, tzaddik is everything. And if you want to be okay, just get on his wagon. You know, he'll slap you out by the payas, as the Rav Nachman used to say. Everything is the tzaddik. The tzaddik. Because the tzaddik is whole. Tzaddik is healthy. Tzaddik is balanced. Tzaddik is integrated. He's integrated all of his parts, integrated all of his mitzvahs, and he loves all people. He's integrated all the Jewish people. So the Rav Shet said, and the Igor Dekala, I should know who that is, but I didn't have a chance to look, um, say that we say L'Shem Yichud because we want 
to connect what we're doing when we do each mitzvah, when we dive in with study Torah, to tzaddikim. And the belief that first of all, tzaddikim do it better. And tzaddikim do it better. And we want to do a mitzvah based on their kavana, their intent. Moreover, we want to be attached to them as they're doing these mitzvahs so that we have the tzaddik advantage. And the tzaddik advantage is wholesomeness, health, and balance. I have 613 components to my body. I have 248 limbs. I use them all. I don't waste anything. I have a brain I use. I have a heart I use. I have sense I use. Everything is completely utilized in the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, And that intensity creates balance because I'm not, there's no pieces of me that hang like a, a limp limb because I wasted it because I didn't use it efficiently. So the L'Shemir HaKadosh Baruch the idea is we're joining our prayer, our mitzvahs, our tater with those of the tzaddik and enjoying it with the tzaddik. First of all, we're, we're on the tzaddik. We want whatever the tzaddik's doing should happen to us, should work for us. And we want to join with the tzaddik as if he's davening for us. That's how the Hasidic can have. It's classic Hasidus. It really is. When I say Hasidus, I mean not Chabad. It's classic Hasidus, to put it in those words. And then the Chirabal, the Chirabal, you want to say something? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask. Um, so, Lashem Yechud, that, what you just said, is the functionality of it, or it's the intention? It's the intent. It's the meaning. The meaning. Yeah. And I, 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 it, technically, it is the functionality. These words are Kabbalistic words. They're holy words. They're Zoyar words. So, it is magic in the you words. That we, are connecting? That we would like to connect to the Tzaddik, who knows what he's doing, and he knows how to do it. We want to be on his, on his bandwagon. And I, and I think that everyone would say, well, wait, don't be a tzaddik. Be a Baal Tshuva. God wants Baal Tshuvas too. <laughs> and you're just fine. You know, your relationship you have with the tzaddik is not that you climb on his bandwagon, but you let the tzaddik inspire you to be a Baal Tshuva. This is a different kind of chasidus. And in that world, that's the way they thought. Just climb on the tzaddik's wagon and be secondary to him, which is always a good thing, even in our opinion. But you want your Yiddishkeit to be a reflection of the tzaddik's Yiddishkeit, rather than your own as a Baal Tshuva, which I think would be more consistent with Chabad, I think. The Chernobyl Ed says something else. And again, I talked about this last week. And he basically says everything has life. Everything has life. There's life in a person. There's life in a physical thing. There's life in a, everything has life. And the source of life is God. Meaning, I know I'm alive because I have a soul. Right? Do I understand my soul? Do I feel my soul? Not very much. Do I understand and feel that my soul is one with God? Even less. So the Chernobyl's argument is that when we practice Yiddishkeit, we do Torah, Mitzvahs, and Tefillah. In their perspective, that they say L'Shem Yechud before they do every single Mitzvah, before they study any part of Torah, before they do any prayer. The idea is that I want to extract life from within me and life within the physical thing that I'm using to perform the mitzvahs, like the straps of the tefillin or the candles of Hanukkah or the flour and the oil and water that we're using in separating challah or whatever mitzvah we're using in the physical world. And to extract the life from within myself and from within the physical thing and have it join with divine life. Meaning I want to experience how my life is connected to the source of life which is Hashem. And that's how he explains to the Shem Yechud. So the Shem Yechud is a, a statement that says, I know there's life everywhere. I know there's life in everything. I want to join it together with the source of life, which is HaKadosh Baruch That's what the uh, Chernobyl, the Nebuchadnezzar Chernobyl says. Okay? And la I'm going to say one more thing, and then I'm going to let you ask your questions. And lastly, the Harav Einstein himself, this, the, 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 the compiler of this book, Sidan Agoinim, Bamakubolam Bachasidim, he takes the Nadim to the task. And I tell you, as they say in the real world, don't mess with the Nadim <laughs> The Nadim was a Gorn and a Tzaddik and a Kaddish. He was a Mishnagit. So, tough luck. He your heart out. Now, the Rebbe said he wasn't even a Mishnagit, but. Um, he wrote this scathing tshuva. In other words, he wasn't against Hasidim and Hasidis, but he did write this very, very critical tshuva objecting to the arrestation of the Shem Yichud. And Weinstock says, excuse me, Mr. Um, uh, and he brings also from uh, um, uh, 
Chaim Chenitz, who also critically, very critically attacks the restation of Hashem Yichud, he said, how can you oppose the Hashem Yichud? I don't understand you. Isn't it true that when you do a mitzvah, you have kavana? Isn't it basic to Jewish thinking that when you do a mitzvah, tzrich is kavana, when you do a mitzvah, you're supposed to have a proper intent? How can you tell a person not to say the whole meaning of the Hashem They should have a kavana for the sake of Hashem. When you're studying Torah, when you're praying, when you're doing mitzvahs. And the Weinstock, his approach is so, he sort of feels so confident in objecting to what the Neid of Yehuda says. He says, why would you say that? Why would you say not to say L'Shem Yichud? It's a basic idea. When a Jew does something, you have to pay attention to what he's doing. It's that meaning. In the language of the Gemara, mitzvah, tzich is kavana. When you do a mitzvah, you're supposed to have a certain intent. You're supposed to have a certain kavana. And I mentioned this to you two weeks ago. There's an argument. There's a halachic debate. If I blow shayfer and they have no kavana to do the mitzvah of blowing shayfer, I'm doing it to Masasik. I'm a mekayim the mitzvah or not. And then, assuming I blew shayfer and I knew that I'm doing it to the mitzvah, do I have to know the particular meaning of why I'm blowing shayfer or is it just to have the basic meaning? There's a big argument whether mitzvahs need kavana or not. And as I explained it to you, what's unusual about this argument is this argument appears in the Gemara. The Gemara brings different opinions about whether the question of mitzvah sikh is kavana or not. And the Gemara really has very subtle uh, conflicts in the way it presents its halachic position. And usually when the Gemara argues about something, the Rishonim no longer do. They all agree. Right? The Gemara does an argument and the rabbis basically all agree what the halacha is. This is one of those instances where the Gemara argues about it and then the Rishonim argue about it again. The Rambam holds you have to have kavon, you do mitzvahs. The way it's brought is the Rajba holds, no, you don't have to have kavon, you do mitzvahs. There's a big debate whether mitzvahs, sikh is kavon or not. Um, but everybody would agree that even if you hold, that if you did a mitzvah without kavon, you still yoytzeh, having kavon would be better. Right? The Allah is saying, don't have kavon. The Allah is saying, even if you didn't have kavon, you yoytzeh the mitzvah, but it's far better to do the mitzvah with kavon than do the mitzvah without kavon. And this is what the Weinstock, the Moiti, the Oyer, the Malaket, the Machaber of this Sefer, Seder HaGoyner of Gevolim of HaChasidim, says in arguing with the Nehdeh Yehuda. And I mentioned to you two weeks ago that Hasidus brings this argument, whether Mitzvah Sikh is given or not, and says that they're both true. Halachically, they're both true. Why? Because on one level, you're not supposed to have a kavon. You just both do it because God said don't try and just, the greatest kavana you can have is, I don't know the meaning, God said, and I'm doing it. And if you read the language of the Nehdeh Yehuda, that may be what he's trying to say. Don't try to figure out the meaning of the mitzvah, so just do it. The other opinion is, each mitzvah has a different kavana, not just that Hashem said to do it, a specific kavana. So the Chassidus brings, you have it in the middle of you have it in the Rebbe Hashab, that both are true. You're supposed to do a mitzvah without a kavana, just for the sake of God. And you're supposed to do a mitzvah with a kavana, knowing the particular meaning of the mitzvah. So there's two levels. So the Weinstock saying to the Neide Yehuda, excuse me, sir, why would you object to people saying, it's a halacha, you're supposed to have kavana, would come down to this question, what kind of kavana you would need. But that's my final thought. Does anybody have any questions or any comments? I warn you, if you have no comments or no questions, I will break. <laughs> I don't mean break myself. I'll break the class. Okay. I'll come back in five, please. And, and I'm going to do the Sikha now. Okay. Come back at 11.30. I'm going to start. Believe me, I did. Okay. You're also with the class at the beginning of the year, yeah? Um, yeah. Yeah. Where do you normally sit? Here. Yeah. You were in my house once, right? Yes. This is amazing. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm amazing. Thank you, <laughs> Thanks for forgiving me for not remembering you. Uh, okay. Okay, five minutes, people. Thank you for the water very much. There's a lady in Israel who's going to answer Omen on my bracha. Oh, I'm 
message from the office, so I'm going to go downstairs. Do whatever you have to. Yeah. But if I come back late, that's why. Oh, come on. Okay, I'm not gonna bother answering her. Okay. I believe the first charge was in August. So it was August, September, October, November, and I guess December if it already went through. So keep one more. Keep uh, August, obviously, is what I pledged. Keep September as well. And if you can refund the other ones, it would be nice. Thank you very much. The Sfarim Menachem Tzian that they gave our after Gimel Talmud has a letter from the Rebbe to a uh, community in Northern California when when Itch Spring Itch was there where a woman died of the same sepatera. And it was very tragic. And the question they had is how could something bad happen at a good event? That letter may speak to what you need. If you can't find it, then you remind me, I'll try to find you a picture of it. By the way, yet Vashteach, why all the jobs? Did you see this thing? There was this Turkish uh, minister who got up to speak about how he's going to kill all the Jews in the world for what they're doing in Gaza. And right in the middle of Turkey, the guy fell over and had a heart attack. Really? It's hyster yeah, it's hysterical. That's amazing. You didn't see it? No. Oh, it's going around. Will you send it to me? I'll send it to Rabbi Yeah, I'll send you the link. That's amazing. It's so funny. 
He had bad kavana. He had very good kavana, actually. Well, I mean, for him. Yeah, he got him. <laughs> See if I can find it. It's funny because when you just said that, I was reading Psalm 34. It says, Evil brings death upon the wicked. <laughs> I, I don't know if this has. Um, a video attached to it, but uh, I'm sending. I don't have my phone. Does not allow me to look at uh, you know the different. You can probably find it on somewhere. Uh, I sent you the link. All right. It's hysterical. The guy drops down on the on the spot, literally. Yeah, there's a video here. <laughs> it's it's. He speaks in Yiddish. Huh? He speaks in Yiddish. To me. Oh, you know Yiddish? No, but he, Rabbi Eli only talks to me and he texts me only in Hebrew and he talks to me in Yiddish, so I'll learn. Are you learning? Yeah. Oh, sweet. <laughs> I like um I really like the old really really old Liguna, but she he knows all of all of them. So we're always sharing back and forth and then if I have questions, I try to write him in Hebrew because I'm trying to, you know, I'm right. trying to learn more. But he's also teaching me Yiddish. Because I said I want to learn Yiddish. I feel like a lot of young people don't learn Yiddish. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's that important, then, frankly. That's my take. You don't think it's important? Hebrew is important. Yeah. The reason to know Yiddish is for the Rebbe Sikhis, but That's what I mean. I think it's important for some people to be able to speak Yiddish. Right. And I feel like if you could speak Yiddish, you can infuse certain things into your home. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. The culture affects... Okay, it's uh, 300 seconds times two. Our class has been evacuated, but we're going to start. Yeah. Call their bluff. So I have a story for this occasion. That when we first got married, my wife and I, we lived in Carolyn Kingston. Oh, you can walk to 770 in four minutes. And um, in those days, you could get a hookup line. But the Rebbe used to speak on the yeah. uh, during the week all the time, so they would you could pay fifty dollars a month. How to go go to your house? And you have your own you dial your own phone number. Oh, that's nice. And uh, you could tune in seven seventy. But uh, the Rebbe spoke what a few times a week, but there was always something on the program because if there was any activity in seven seventy, anybody was on the microphone, you'd be able to hear. Huh. If there was a Fabrengen, if there was a CMA Rambam, anything happening formal. He would broadcast it live. So there was a lot of interesting to pay to him. And otherwise, he just put stuff on, you know, recordings or whatever it was. It was audio. It was not video. So um, I turned the phone on. And they, there's a CMA Rambam taking place in 770. Now, the CMA Rambams, there are 83 halachas in Rambam. 83 halachas in Rambam. You finish it in less than a year, less than a lunar year. So it's like almost every week you have a CMA Rambam or even more. No, every... We have one and two thirds Yumei Rambam on average. It happens very frequently, so they're not very well attended because 
The end of a halacha, end of a, a section, there's 14 sections, also was, uh, you know, every two weeks. But the end of a halacha, every two, three days. So the, he'd have these human 770, and he'd, people would come and sit. Basically, people wanted to eat uh, some food, <laughs> came and sit and eat, and he had some speakers. And he worked very hard on making it happen. I'm sitting on Kingston and Carroll. I put up on the hookup, and he's the rabbi in charge, Rabbi Galiski, who's very dramatic, is talking about this. He has a whole list of things he has to say, all these religious introductions that he has to say. And he's announcing in 770, there's a couple more seats available. There's a couple, if you want, there's a seat, there's a couple empty seats. So I'm sitting on Carol and Kingston, when a couple of us sit. So I got out of my house, I walked to say, there's three That's people true. sitting there, there's nobody. <laughs> the whole show's empty, but when you listen to the hookup, there's a, there's a couple of seats available. It's the place is packed. <laughs> so he's playing to the audio crowd, to the audience. Anyway, there's a couple of seats available left in this room. I'm sorry, it's so crowded, but there's a couple of seats available. So let's do the sicha. This is a wonderful sicha of the Rebbe. I remember when it came out, I remember learning it. And this idea that Rebbe's repeated many times, and to me, this is the watershed. Here. This is a foundational sikha. It's a fundamental sikha in the Rebbe's thinking about the Alta Rebbe Siddur. Now, you've talked about this already. I've talked about it already. I mentioned to you, first of all, the first thing about the Alta Rebbe Siddur is it's probably the only Siddur that exists that we know exactly who wrote it. Of course, the Siddur goes back to the but the preciseness of the Nusach and the Diktok would be the Hebrew grammar the choice of words and the Kabbalah stuff, most Sidurim are a work of many. People contributed, people added. And sometimes when someone writes a Siddur and you try to fix it, you actually make it worse trying to fix it. As we all know, you have to edit the edits and the edit of the edit of the edit, and it never finishes. The Alter Rebbe Siddur know exactly who wrote it, when he wrote it, and why he wrote it. Alter Rebbe wanted to make a Siddur which is consistent with Dikto. Hebrew gram was very important to the Alter Rebbe. And the Shara Koil was called the 13th gate of which that is all speaks, which is above the meditation of each of the little Shavit. And um, he also wanted it to be consistent with, um, with Kabbalah. So the Alter Rebbe Siddur is a very unusual work that joins together schools of thought in Jewish life, Jewish religion that are conflicted and contradictory. And the Alter Rebbe wove Kabbalah, Halacha, Diktuk, Arizal into one piece of work. And it took a mind like the Alter Rebbe's to make that happen. So in the Hasidic world, we're the only ones done from the Siddur. And Breslev and Hasidim, who know Breslev, also daven from our Siddur. All the other Hasidic communities daven from what's called the Hasidic Siddur. Um, when I was growing up, what's called Tikkun Meir Nusach Sfad. It's a Nusach Sfad Siddur. It's Nusach Sfad of Ashkenaz. You see, we're not Sfadim. Sidim or Ashkenazim, but they're Ashkenazim who adopted many things from the Hasidic, from the Sephardic communities. So it's the Nusach Sfad of the Ashkenazim. That's what Hasidim David. I like to call it Sidi Kesen Nehoira, because I have a volume called Kesidi Kesen Nehoira, which is a Haskama from the Koshen Samagid, who was a contemporary of the Alter Rebis, which means a long, long time ago this Sidi existed. I've mentioned it to you in the past. In the Rebis library, there is an original manuscript of Siddur, which the Baal Shem Tev physically used. Baal Shem Tev had a handwritten Siddur, which he davened out of, and from what I understand, the Nusach that the Baal Shem Tev used in his handwritten Siddur is, um, is the, it's not, it's not the Alter Rebbe's Nusach, it's the Siddur, the Hasidic Nusach Sfad, the Kesa Nehoira Siddur. So, few Hasidim actually daven from the Alter Rebbe's Nusach. And there's all kinds of reasons, and one of the reasons is, is the belief that it's too holy. In some Hasidic communities, the Hasidic Rebbe, the Tzaddik, uses our Nusach, and the Hasidic Dhamma of the Hasidic Nusach fired. In other Hasidic communities, and we knew such a Jew, my father knew such a man, our neighbor, across the street, that the Chazan, on the, in the Shul, on the Bimah, on the Omad with the Chazan Daven, there was an Alter Rebbe's Nusach. Whoever was the Chazan Daven from our Nusach, and the whole community Daven from the Hasidic uh, Nusach fired, in the belief that the Siddur is too holy for the commoner. And this is an issue that the Rebbe talked about often. The Rebbe felt that that's a big mistake. The Rebbe argued, the Rebbe is always an hour, Rebbe argued that when the Alter Rebbe made his Nusach, it's true it's a very holy Nusach. It's true it's very Nusach because it goes to the deepest secrets of Kisvi Arizal. But at the same time, the Alter Rebbe felt that everybody could and should. His quote on this is, Shove nefesh. It's equal to all. 
as holy as this nusach may be, as precise as this nusach may be, it is shavalach nefesh, it is meant to be used by everybody. This is how the Rebbe himself did the Alta Rebbe's nusach. And the Rebbe went to bat for this. In other words, the Rebbe was a Rebbe for many, many, many years. And over the course of those many, many years, the Rebbe initiated many, many uh, projects or initiatives or inspirations. There was a unique body of time in the early 1960s where the Rebbe was on the soapbox of people davening our nusach that we should make people appreciate that this is better, it's special, it's precise, and that it's not only for tzaddikim and for achazim, it's made for everybody to use. And the Rebbe had a simple proof, a simple support for his position, which was that if the Al Rebbe in fact, made this city to be in such a holy level that it's only meant for mystics to use, he would have put the meditations into the text, into the city, around the city, put the meditations. I don't know if you know this. I have at home, I have at home four different siddhas that are all called siddhas harizal. I just never wrote a siddhas. Uh, the truth of that isn't right very much at all. Al-Rizal spoke. He didn't write. His disciple, Chaim Vital, wrote. And Al-Rizal wrote, spoke about meditations. And there are four versions of the Rebbe Siddin. One is from Ben Usher, one is from Ben Shapsi, and one is from Ben Yankiv, and one is from, 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 from one of the uh, earlier Godel. But there's also a, a Siddin called Siddin Zalkaveh, which I do not possess. It's a fifth Siddin Al-Rizal, which I think was written by the Misnagdim in the times of the Vashant of the al Rebbe. And I don't mean this pejoratively. I mean it very respectfully, but the gross people made a Siddur Hadith, I think, which I do not have. Um, and the differences in the meditations from one version to the next, there's differences to the version of the next. Those meditations are not in our Siddur. Our Siddur reads like a simple Siddur. Um, and the Rebbe says, if the al Rebbe meant as many Hasidic groups, as many Hasidic rabbis, many Hasidic Rebbe's contended, that this Nusach is so holy, it's so special, and so distinct, that it should only be used by holy people, he would have put that into it. He would have put the meditations into it. And the fact that he did not disprove that it's Shavuot Lechon Nefesh, it's meant for everybody. And one last thought, and then we're going to read the text. The Alter Rebbe says, the Rebbe, our Rebbe says, that there is something called Kavanas, or Kavanot, meditations. Kavanas, means to know the mystical meaning of every mitzvah to know the mystical meaning of every prayer wonder when you do it this is a very very difficult thing to do you have to be okay you have to be a, a, a super brain to be able to do this people describe to me people describe i never saw this people describe to me that the rebbe would sit by the seder for the first 20 years after the rebbe was ever his seder was semi-public he sat at his mother-in-law's table, the feeding of his table, surrounded by other men you could watch. The Rebbe had two, two Haggadahs open at the same time. The Rebbe did his own thing. When the Rebbe had to say that he didn't leave, someone else let us say it. The Rebbe just did it. The feeding of his place was here, was empty. There was matzahs and a cup for Kiddush set as if the feeding of was physically present. The Rebbe sat to the feeding of his left over here. The Rashad sat on the feeding of his right. And the Rebbe behaved as if he never didn't Lead. He wouldn't even say anything unless you asked a question, then he would respond. And the Rebbe had his Agoda, and next we had the Siddur of Shapsi, which is the preferred version of the uh, Kabbalistic meditation that is for Archabad Rebbe's. And he would look back and forth like this. He would read very quickly. Rebbe Bechal did everything very quickly. And as he was saying the Agoda, you'd watch him go back and forth from the meditations to the prayer for the meditation. Right there. The speed at which he did it is, 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 supersonic. If you understand how meditations work, it's it's code. It's like reading mathematical formula. It's, it's not written out in law. It's all but names of God and gematrius and stuff. And the Rebbe would, would, you would actually watch him do the Sadi back in when. It looked like it wasn't a big deal, but uh, if you have a brain like the Rebbe, it's no big deal. But you and me, we can't do it. We can't do it. And if we did it, it would take up. It really, it's just very, very, very involved. So you would actually watch the Rebbe during the Haggadah, go back and forth from what he was reading and from the meditations. It's called the Aitzi Kavanas, people do meditations, which are great people, great minds, very holy people, very pure people, do things according to Kabbalah. So the Rebbe writes, and you're going to see it in the Sikha momentarily, that when he made a Siddur, when the Alta Rebbe, our father, the Avinu Adishan, the Alta Rebbe made his Siddur, 
he actually meant for people to say it because of Kabbalistic significance, because of Kabbalistic precision, because of meditations. Because the Alta Rebbe held that even people who are not on the level of Kavana have a connection to Kavana. If I can do the meditation, at least I'll read the words that carry those meditations, and have a relationship with the meditations. And that is the way to understand the Alta Rebbe Siddur. Statement number one, your battery is running low. You might want to plug your PC in. Okay, thank you for the instructions. I'm not in charge. I only work and that's not my department. <laughs> um, the Alta Rebbe, the Alta Rebbe wrote a Nusa. Oh, so the two statements would be statement number one that the Alta Rebbe said it is Shavel Nefesh, it's uniform for everybody. And the proof is they didn't put the Kavanas in. And at the same time, even though it's Shavel Nefesh, on the one hand, he is saying that when you dive from this Nusa, and you don't have a clue what the meditations are. It says in Hayyam Yayim, it's actually written in Hayyam Yayim, that when a person davens and he doesn't know the meditations, the person davens, he should just think that Hashem should consider it as if he thought all the meditations and accept his prayer as if he davens with the meditations, even though he doesn't know the meditations. This is Hayyam Yayim that says this, this idea. So those are the two sides. A, it's for everybody. B, he did mean that we all have a connection to the Kavanas. But you so to speak, you, you, you achieve what the Kavanas are meant to achieve by saying these words, by diving from the proper text. And even though you don't know the meditation, it's as if you had the meditations. This is the position of our Rebbe in explaining the Alta Rebbe's Nusach. It's for everybody. And it absolutely means that everybody, at least on a spiritual level, is connected to the Kavanas meditations. You just have a general kavana that Hashem should consider as if you had all the kavanas. Okay? Does anybody wish to speak or otherwise let's read? Okay, let's read. So the way this works like this, in case you're new, when we do sikhs, which we did until a couple of weeks ago, we read only the underlined. So if you, if, you, if you take out your stack, turn to page 44, you'll see what I underlined and we're just going to read the underlined. So we're not learning the whole sikh. This sikh is about Kiyah Shafer, about blowing Shafer. We're not touching the Tkir Shefer part. We're speaking only about the Shem Yichud part, okay? Based on these two foundational ideas that number one, the Alter Rebbe said it is Shavel Echol Nefesh. Alter Rebbe made a city of equal for all people. And number two, that when you say the words of this Nusach, even if you do not know the meditations, it's as if you have a connection to the meditations as well. So here we go, page 44, second column. Siddur at Meirazok, the Alter Rebbe's text of Siddur. That Av Shekova as Nusach at Fila Pika Vonus Arizal. He fixed the text of the liturgy, the words of the prayer, to be consistent with the Kabbalistic meditations of that Arizal. It should be precise. The wording should be precise in a way that will bring forward the meditation of Kabbalah. And it means specifically the Kabbalah of the Arizal, because there's different Kabbalahs. And the Arizal's Kabbalah is considered higher than the other Kabbalahs. Like Arizal writes in his introduction to the Shara Kavanis and the B'nai Chaim that there are actually 12 Nusachs, each Shevet, each tribe in its own Nusach. The Arizal says, now we only know four of those Nusachs, but originally there were 12 different texts of prayer to correspond to the 12 Shvatim. Most people do not know which Shevet they belong to, and therefore what Nusach they should dive in. So he created a higher level of prayer. If you read in Rabbi Miguel's introduction to our English, he brings this there, that it's called the 13th gate, the inclusive gate, that no matter what Shevet you belong to, going through this gate gets you to heaven uh, properly. And the Arizal made Kavonis to conform to this 13th gate, to this highest level. And the Alter Rebbe wrote a text of Siddur that represents, or that carries forward this particular approach. In addition to the fact, it should be precise, according to the Hebrew grammar, and Valoshin, and syntax, and language, and form. Alter Rebbe wanted a Siddur to be perfect. Halacha, Kabbalah, Diktuk, you name it. And he worked incredibly hard to create such a perfect version of Siddur. Mekomukim at the same time. He did not include, did not copy into the prayer text itself the meditations. 
So if you're making a siddur according to Kabbalah, and specifically you're making a siddur that's conforming to the Kabbalah of the Ariza. So if you're doing all that effort, why don't you include the Kavanas? And the answer is, Lefi nefesh kanal. The actual meditations of Kabbalah is not something which is realistic for everybody to do. I told you this last time, that I was once in 770 in Rosh Hashanah in the afternoon. And I saw a man davening Mincha Rosh Hashanah for the Siddur HaRashash, Rav Shalom Sharabi. What he did was, he took the meditations of Arisa and he writes them out in longhand. So you literally have a whole page with one word, Baruch. <laughs> And the whole page is meditation. Next page, one word, Atta, and a whole page of meditations. Next page, one word, Avayi. It's, it, you can go out of your mind. <laughs> it's like sweet Freeman. Uh, uh, what do you mean? He, his books, he breaks down every single word of the brachas. Uh, but, but this I wish. It's not each brach, each word. Yeah. So I'm watching this, you pray, and he's looking at the meditations and he's reading. So I waited for him to finish. I've never seen this like in my life. And I said to him, do you understand what you're doing? Because it's very, it's very impressive. You understand what you're doing? He says, no, I don't. So said, why are you doing it? He says, I like it. <laughs> I like it. Okay, that's a good answer. So the Altarebbe didn't like it that much that we should do it even though we know what we're doing. He just made the text, but he didn't include the Nusr, the Kabbalah. The Chlau Mash, where the truth is that it's implicit in general, the Kabbalists, the Kabbalists that Arizal wrote or spoke, that were written down by his disciples, about how to pray and how to do mitzvahs, was always meant to be for special people. If you don't know how to do things, a big Kabbalah, it doesn't make you a bad Jew. It wasn't meant for everybody. Always meant for a select group. Avo, there's, I want to take it a step further. And this is really the Rebbe's big Kiddush, and that's this. The Zegufu, the fact alone, Shadmur hazokin kebeya nusach hatfil. The Altarebbe writes a text of the liturgy, a text of the prayers, which is nusach shove lechol nefesh. The Hebrew wording of the prayers themselves is uniform. We all say the same words. But he wanted that the wording of the prayers should be mechuvin abikabon asarizal, consistent with the meditations of the Arizal, even though most people who are going to use this siddur are incapable of doing the meditations. Here comes the chap. When one prays out of this prayer book, even such people, they know nothing about the meditations. Nothing. But they're reading from this text. They have the effect, actually, of all the mystical things that are brought forward by the people who are doing things according to Gavana Sarit. That is the radical point of the Rebbe. It's made for everybody, and it's special. It's made for everybody, and I'm not special, and I can't do the meditations. But when I read out of this text, says the Bible, Rebbe, it's our Rebbe, in explaining the Alter Rebbe Siddur, it's as if we knew all the meditations, even though we don't know them. And that was the Alter Rebbe's intent. That by davening out of his Nusach, we have the advantage of, as if we did the meditations, even though we do not know the meditation. Only times that go for, for this very reason, Tikkun Admur Hazaken, the Alter Rebbe enacted Nusach Tfilim, a text of prayer, which is Meyus to the Kavanas is based on the Arizal's meditations. And again, he's going away not just from the tradition of Ashkenaz Jews, he's going away from the tradition of Hasidic Ashkenaz Jews, who had this other Siddur, Hasidic Siddur, which the Baal Shem Tov used apparently, called Kesen Nehoira, to work very, very hard to, to sieve out and to sift out and to refine and to perfect. A nusach of tefillah, which should be consistent with Arizal's 13th gate, that they should call Yisrael, that all the Jewish people, Yihiyu Shayachim Le'inyan Kavanas Elu, should have a relation with all these meditations, even though we have no idea what the meditations are. So those are the two sides of the coin. A, Shabbalah Chal Nefesh. It's for everybody. B, davening out of the city does give you a link to the Kavanas. Okay? And in footnote 14, he brings a letter from the Rebbe Rashab. With the Rebbe Shaz basically says, sure, the Rebbe had great kavanas. Well, they like him, they don't like him. You got to do what he said. You got to read it. Just follow the Alter Rebbe's lead. He's, you can trust him. It's cool. Next page, page 45 now. You're doing divrei kveidushas merucham yadma. We all know what the Fidei Rebbe said. And this is in the, this is the quote from the Ayyayi Kren that I mentioned before. You're doing Amakubal. It's known and it's widely accepted. Asher Eilu, that those people, which is me and you and all of us, 
They don't have the kind of mind which is so strong and so focused. To have the kavanas of Kabbalah in davening. Because they lack the knowledge or they lack the focus, lack the meditative powers and so on. Maspik, it's enough. She have no kavana clothes. They should have a basic kavana. The basic kavana is that liyeis tfilose nishmas the fun of yisbarach that our prayers should be heard by Hashem. Im kol la kavanas with all the meditation and bavu others be kisli harizal specific kabbalah specific kabbalah. And even though I don't know what the kavanas are, I'm credited for as if I had davened with those kavanas, even though I didn't say it. But this paragraph we just read is from the game. That even non kabbalists if you have a connection to Hasidus, you dab from the Alter Rebbe's Nusach, and we dab from the Alter Rebbe's Nusach, you have in mind that whatever meditations you're supposed to be thinking that you can't think because you don't know them, it's as if you're doing them, and that your prayer should be accepted on. Okay? Now turn to page 46. Okay? And we move to the shape. So, girls, are we good? Not to say yes, no. They say yes. no, we got a problem. Thank you. Oh, you're so good. The good is that A, the Alter Rebbe said this for everybody. B, it is special. And simply reading these words is if you have all the Kabbalahs. Now comes the question. What about the Shem Yechud? What about the Shem Yechud? Now, girls, you have to understand. There are three places in the Alter Rebbe Siddur where he brings Kavana, Kabbalah in the Siddur. Number one, the Shem Yechud. Number two, by the Seder of Pesach, when you spill the wine, the Alter Rebbe suddenly goes Kabbalah on you. And number three, before you blow shape, and he writes, Yochan Lat Asan and Kebe Shape. He says, And the Rebbe is wondering if the Alter Rebbe did not have his Siddha Kabbalah, why did he see places that he do? Once every morning, the Shem Yechud. Once every year, the Seder, we pour the wine, and once every year, we blow shape and Hashem. This is his question. Now, we're not learning the whole thing. I'm not talking to you about the Tchias part. I'm not talking to you about the wine and basic part is not our business. I'm talking only about the Lishem Yechud part. Now, what's the question? Is it do it before every mitzvah or don't do it at all? Do it once a day makes no sense. And as I explained to you before, the Shara Koyal, the Rebbe's grandfather's grandfather, was very bothered by this question. And the only resolution he was able to come up with is that the Lishem Yechud said before we daven, like a korban, because of a halachic issue. It's not about mitzvahs, it's just about tefillah. Well, the Rebbe is going to disagree with the grandfather and say, no, 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 no. The Shem Yechud is Kabbalistic. The whole city is Kabbalistic. Yeah, but. Right? Yeah, but. Right? It's a Hasidic rabbit. He says, yeah, but. <laughs> Not ribbit, but yeah, but. Yeah. Not, I mean, frog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah, but. That's, it's a Yiddish word, but. Um, so what's the point of saying once day in a prayer, you pray? And the answer is to compromise. Meaning, if you have three choices, never to say it, Always to say it, or say it occasionally. The Rebbe says, "Walk between the raindrops." Let's read it inside. Okay, the Sefre Kabbalah is in Kabbalah works. It's written, "Shekedem Kol Mitzvah." Before you do any mitzvah, Sichem Leima, you must say the Shem Yechud Bichus from the girls, and you have to break that down into three basic columns. Before you study Torah, you have to say the Shem Yechud. Before you pray, you have to say the Shem Yechud, and before you do each and every mitzvah, you have to say the Shem Yechud. Okay, well, the Kama Sidurim, actually many Sidurim, particularly Hasidic Sidurim and Sfadic Sidurim, that Huva Nusachza, in fact, you have these words, the shame, as you're going to be seeing Hashem in the class that I'm going to give you next week. Lifnekim Kama Mitzvahs. Before the performance of multiple Mitzvahs, not just one, before Talas, before Tillin, before everything. Umatsinu Bazed Dover Pele, Besidad Marazak. When it comes to the Alter Rebbe, we find something very odd. He does not put L'Shem Yechud before you do an individual mitzvah, which is what bothers the Shara Koylo. Shouldn't it be before every mitzvah? That's why he concludes. They were saying it for niggler reasons. When you put on Sittas in the Alter Rebbe, there's no L'Shem Yechud. When you put on Tefillin, in the Alter Rebbe, even before you bench Chaydish, which the whole world says the Shem Yechud, we don't say it. Even before you say Sira Sa'ayma, with the whole world says the Shem Yechud. Even the Snagdim say the Shem Yechud. When I walk into an Ashkenaz Shul, and they're saying the Shem Yechud, I'm saying Chasidim won, and the Snagdim lost, and they don't even know that they lost. Because <laughs> the Nebuchadnezzar was so against it. And some of them just say, they don't say the words the Shem Yechud. 
because they know that you're not supposed to say the Kabbalah, because like Kabbalists, but others do. So the Alter Rebbe, who made us say the Kabbalah, he's the only one that says, no, no, don't say it for each mitzvah, once a day before you pray. What is the significance of this, of this position? On the other hand, every day you say it once at the beginning of prayer, so the Rebbe's question is, if you're doing it because you're a Kabbalist, do it many times. If you're not doing it, it's not a Kabbalist, don't do it at all. What's this halfway? I told you this. I was once in the Satma Bangalore colony, and I was very impressed with their the Shem Yucha before Tzitzis. I, I love it. I love these prayers. They're beautiful prayers. So I told them, we don't say them. So we do them once a day. So he answered me in, in Hungarian, Yiddish was, you're afraid of the night of Yehida? And the answer may be yes. You may be able to argue that Al-Tareb knew that they had great respect for him, even though he was in different derech, that the al compromise can be somehow connected to the night of But the Rebbe is not saying that. The Rebbe is saying that it's actually a position, a pikabola. If you're not a Kabbalist and you're doing things a pikabola, you do them halfway. You say the words and you don't do the meditation. And the halfway here is do it once a day, not before each mitzvah. And it's explained that we say the Shemichah just once a day before we daven. And this is sufficient for the entire day. We came a mitzvah, the whole, that all the mitzvahs, the shame you can we say before davening in 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 Baruch Shomar in davening is called a pulon of shachas in for all day. This middle ground that we say it, we only say it once a day. This middle ground is consistent with the Alter approach. I want to throw something in parenthetically, okay, just for fun. That is, excuse me. Um, it's one of the most important little things in the Tanya that no one even knows about it. <laughs> I know about it because I never spoke about it. Then in Kuntus Acheren, the last part of the Tanya, where everyone goes to sleep and says, okay, wake me up. You just kiss it comes, all the Kabbalah stuff in the back that nobody understands. The Alta Rebbe talks a lot about Kavona. Kavona of learning Teda, Kavona of doing Mitras, and Kavona of Davening. And he presents you a very complex philosophy where a bad kavana in Torah is different than a bad kavana in Tfilo, which is different than a bad kavana in Mitzvahs. And, and he brings proofs from the Zoya, from a whole bunch of Zoya, that there's differences between a bad kavana in Davening and a bad kavana in learning. And in the scheme of that, in the course of presenting us with these subtle differences, the al Rebbe says something very interesting. Yeah? Can you expect every person to daven every day, every word with a perfect kavana? And just no. He says the solution is that over the course of the entire year, you should have said each prayer at least once properly. And then they accumulate. You know, the one day you said Barashon properly, joins together with the one day he said Mizmah said it properly, with joins together with the one day of the year that you said Yichav properly, with joins together the one day a year. In other words, if over the course of the year, every piece of David and you David, Rabbi Kavona, it joins together to make a perfect prayer. And doesn't only raise up that prayer, it raises up all the other 364 prayers that were, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. So this is an interesting idea. It's also it's similar, it's not the same, but that we do it, we don't do it every day perfectly, we do it once. And when it comes to the same year, we do it once each day, not once a year. Here's the question. If the recitation of Shemichat is for everybody, why not fix the same for every single mitzvah? On the other hand, if it's not for everybody, why say it once a day? Either say it before each mitzvah or never say it. Now, look in footnote 29. This was the class of two weeks ago. And the Shara Koil answers the question by connecting the Shemichat to Karbonus and to Tfila specifically. In other words, the Shara Koil, in trying to understand why the Alter Rebbe includes the Kabbalistic meditation of Shemichat, once in the Siddur, explains it up in Allah, not a Kabbal. But the Rebbe is disagreeing with his Aida. He's disagreeing with his grandfather. And it's written very subtly just by making a reference to it in footnote 29. And he's going to give you his own unique approach. But yes, Shleimah, the answer is. You with me? Page 46, last paragraph. Apimash and his Baal Sebeis, based on what we discussed before about Tchia Shaifa, which we're not discussing. The Be'etzem, Svita Leila, Burazok, and the Altreba holds as a matter of principle. Shinyan Akavonis, 
the meditations, Gam Abiyasoid, including the meditations of Kabbalah, Shayech Lachal Nefesh. Every Jew really has a connection and should have a connection to the Kabbalistic meditations of David. But our ability to have a relationship with the Nifal is only when it comes to the to the to the passive event, what's going to happen as a result, the nifal, the effect of our God. Shalachal nafesh nitin keach. Every Yiddish and Nisham will give him the strength. Lifel to affect as Hanyanim v'ham shaches those ideas and those drawings down. Ham mefurashim tapa forty seven now the kavanah samitz which explicitly the kavanah samitzvus av shemaise hakavanes eini davish cholav even though the process of doing the meditation is not the same for everybody we can't all meditate we can't all meditate the same way we're still connected to the kavanas we're not connected to the kavanas and thinking the kavanas we're connecting us and saying the words which are consistent with the kavanas and getting credit for the kavanas even though we didn't do the meditation that's his position and therefore the Rebbe concludes our pz need a limit that's what I want to say you say it only once a day. You don't say it for a once a day. Why? Because it's a middle ground. A, you have a connection to Kabbalah. B, you're not a Kabbalist. A, you have a connection to Kabbalah. Say the Shem Yichud. B, because you're not a Kabbalist who knows the actual meditations, once a day is enough. A Jew must bring about the unification of HaKadosh Baruch and Shechina. Became called mitzvah, mitzvah, which is going to be manifest in doing it each mitzvah. The Mesha Kalayim Kula with the course of the entire day. That Av She'ene Dava Rasham Elochal Nefesh, even though it's not equal for everybody to the Shem Yichud. Lechav and the Shem Yichud Bechulu. Became called mitzvah, mitzvah. How we do every single one of the mitzvahs. The Mesha Kalayim Kula during the course of the day. So none of us, at least most of us, are not in the position to actually have the proper kavanas. So I want to tell you a cute story. I have a collection of sedurim, which has grown over the years. I have quite a few sedurim. And uh, a young man reaches out to me, a Russian fellow. I, I didn't know him. His wife learned here. This goes back 20 years. He said, I understand that you have sedurim on bigger boy. I said, yeah. He borrowed the shalom and the ramak. Basically, it's it's filled with and the ramak. The guy was younger than I was. And he was about shuba. And I, I mean, I couldn't imagine how smart he was. I said, what do you need to study? But I want to look through them. I said, what are you going to have for me? He says, oh, I'm going to know them. And then Pablo, no, 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 I have a photograph. He tells me, I have a photographic memory. So he comes, he borrows Dusadurim. A week later, brings him back. He says, test me. The guy blew my mind. He knew all the meditations. <laughs> he looked through it. Again, that's such a rare, if that person's memory could be matched by his intelligence, the guy's a superman. A normal person again. And he knew by heart. So he was going to dive with the Kabbalah of the Shalom, which is the Alter Rebbe did before he became the Hasid, he dive in the Shalom's meditations, without even having the book open in front of him, just from memory, from reading it. It's a remarkable gift. Most people don't have the kind of memory and the kind of retention and understanding it is a whole nother level. So the Rebbe says, we can't do it and we can't do it properly. But we don't not do it at all. We do it once a day. It's a compromise. The It's true that it's not uniform for everybody. To have the proper meditations when saying the mitzvah. I do every single separate mitzvah. In the course of the day, nevertheless. That it is within the power of each person to have this kavana. I'll call upon him on at least on the level called each one according to his level one of the things you have in the introduction of Tanya is that the mitzvahs were all the same a holy Jew doesn't eat more matzah a holy Jew doesn't shake an essay for more days a holy Jew doesn't blow more sounds of shayfa the mitzvah is the same but the meditations the kavanah is it says in Zayar every person is in a different place in their ability to meditate so the Rebbe says, every human being, every Jew, according to whatever limit level he's on, has a relationship with the idea of thinking that as he davens, he's doing it in a way which is consistent with Kabbalah, at least Bishah Satfila. Not when he puts on tzitzis, not when he puts on tefillin, 
Not when he studies Torah, which you do after davening, and there's a meditation for that also. Not when you give tzedakah. You did, I mean, these are all things written in Kabbalah's for you know, over the course of the day. You do this mitzvah, and you do this mitzvah, a whole schedule of what mitzvah you're supposed to do according to the mystical meditations. But once a day before you daven, that's enough. But that you got to do because you could. Each person at his level, the most basic level is, I don't know what I'm doing, but you do. So you make it, you work, they work it out that my davening and my mitzvahs and my Torah should be consistent with, uh, with these kavanas, even if I do not know the kavanas. Um, Saying these words and having this meditation at the beginning of the day, Nimsheches is drawn to all the various things. Hanas and Bemeshach Yem Zed that happened in the course of that day. Kanaz we discussed before, page 47. It's the right column. The last couple of lines are underlined. And this explains the Alter Rebbe's opinion. He fixed that we say it once a day in the morning prayer, or Bazeg Gufa, more specifically, Betchilas had to feel the very beginning of the morning prayer before I brought up Now, some people would say, why not do it before Adeni Makabo? And they, actually, the Shara Kaidel gives his opinion for why, but he's speaking from a halachic angle. We're speaking from a Kabbalah angle, so you can't really, we can't use his answer. But there's a, why it's put before Baruch Shama and not before Adeni Makabo, I don't know. But the idea is that Rebbe is really saying that the Alter Rebbe is walking between the raindrops. He's making a central position. The central position is everybody has the shaykhs with this nusach. Because everybody shaykhs to Kabbalah, Kabbalah, even if you have the shaykhs to Kabbalah at all. So you consider it, you, you say to Hashem, you put the words together, you make the tzidah from work, you make my davening mystical. And once a day we say the Shem Yichud, and each one of us on our own individual level tries to affect that in saying the Shem Yichud, we're, we're, we're achieving what the Kabbalah has been at least in part. Now we're supposed to have the Kabbalah all of a sudden, which we could have yes. to Yeah, but the Kabbalah Shemichud is, you know, I gave you a whole bunch of background. You know, we're, we're doing it for the sake of Hashem. We're connecting the Abishah to the world. We're bringing life into everything. All the different ideas that I mentioned that are mystical. And we do it once a day before the Shemichud. And the more, the additional Kabbalah is that it should spill out into everything you do over the course of this day. So that's going to affect all the Correct, right. But if we were truly Kabbalists, then we do it before every mitzvah, as we should. Since we're not truly Kabbalists, we make it work. The shame of truly the Meshach. That's all day long. Does it only affect all the mitzvahs of that day if you have that Kabbalah, that you're you know, at a basic level of what you're doing to say the Shemichud? When people ask such questions, I have a standard answer, which is don't worry about it. Just do your best. No, do your best. Do your best. Do your, tell you he does our best. You know, if the Abisha doesn't like what he made, he didn't have to make it. No one asked him to make a Holocaust. No one asked him to de destroy the continuity of Jewish tradition in every Jewish community in the world and to, 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 to rebirth the Jewish people after the Holocaust with a complete disconnect from their ancestry and to try to figure it out. We're good. We're good. You know why? Because we can be so much worse. And we justify it. We do our best. That's all we can do. Don't eat your heart I'm not trying to say this to be callous or to be cavalier. It's the truth. You know, we, we come from a very rich tradition. Chabad is a very rich tradition. But it's not for the faint of heart. And we're the faint of heart. But we're the next link in that chain. So how can we next link in a chain which we have very little to do with? And the answer is, we do the best we can, and that's it. If the Abish doesn't like it, he can be Mashiach. No one's stopping him. We're not stopping him from being Mashiach. He's stopping him from being Mashiach, and he can fix all of this. Then we'll all be connected to these meditations. That's how we do it. But this is the position of the Alta Nebis. So the takeaway is, <laughs> I, I, I think about this a lot. I really do. I think about this a lot, because Kabbalah and Hasidus are not the same thing. They seem the same. They overlap a lot. Kabbalah and Hasidus are not, they're really not the same thing. Kabbalah and Hasidus are two different philosophies. Two different philosophies, let alone bodies of knowledge. And the Rebbe is saying part of the Hasidic teaching is that everything written in Kabbalah for those really weird special Jews is for all of us. That's the difference. Kabbalah was made by special people for special people. Hasidus was made by a very special person for every ordinary person. 
And it goes so far as to say that even the mystical meditations, which we have no business, we don't understand them, we don't begin to know how to practice them, are really for everybody. So we dabble in it. We dabble like that Jew in 770. I'll never forget the scene. I each day went to the Bible show. I, I remember where I was standing. A year just standing and diving for the sins of the shash. He's turning pages like he's looking at pictures. <laughs> so I wanted to see what he's doing. And he said that Rashash, every word is a page. I mean, just the beginning. The meditations are not that long. If, if it was literally every word a page, and Chmanessa would be a volume of books. And I waited him to finish diving. And when he was done, I said, uh, You know what you're doing? He says, No, no, I have a clue. So, what are you doing? It? I like it. <laughs> I like that answer. I like it. Um, but the Rebbe is saying it's not just I like it, there's credibility to it. One of the things that Hasidus has given the world is that Jews who have no connection to Kabbalah have a connection to Kabbalah. And we actually do something about it. We say the Shemir once a day. We do the meditations before Shoifa once a year. We do the meditations and we still the wine in the cup, in the plate on Pesach once a year. Those are the three cases where in the Alter Rebbe Siddur, he put the meditation and they're supposed to carry over for the whole year. That's the concept. Go ahead. Did you remember talk where he says um, about uh, he wrapped his building once a day to sit his four line on over Torah day and night? Right? Oh, so that's the Bible, the Bible is. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Tired of that. But I'm saying it's a similar, he's saying just do it once a day and it's as if you were doing this. All It's an adjustment. For a common, more common person that maybe can't wrap with. I, I, I think it's accurate. Um, I think it's accurate. I'm saying it's a, I, it's I, a similar thing to saying some doing something once a day versus doing it multiple times a day without the true um, kavana behind it. No? Yeah. It's kind of similar. It's an adjustment for a person that can, for whatever reason, do it. It's more than an adjustment. It's an empowerment. Yeah, and empower that's what I mean. It's like a only a tzaddik could make this up. Yeah, you have to be the Alter Rebbe. You know, you have to have such an access to holiness that you can put into your prayer that a simple shlub reads these words and doesn't know what the Hebrew means, and it's as if he died from the pikabala. You can't just say I like that. You have to put it into the siddur. That's a holiness right. that the Alter Rebbe implanted in the siddur. It's what the Balshem they brought into the world. But also to empower someone to say, if you just wrap the phone once a day, it's such a big, it's a big, such a big mitzvah for you. I, I understand the correlation. Yeah. I understand the yeah. comparison. I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. Shall we? If I have to 20 after, I gave you two minutes. Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm and call two of them. We want Mashiach now. And do not forget our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land.